know, here, here's an example. There was a case in Ohio in 2019 where there was a police officer who, on his body-worn camera footage, literally planted evidence, drugs, at a scene. And when they looked at the footage, and I can't help but smile here because this is what I'm going to say. sounds like I'm making it up. You can Google it and read more about this. When they saw the footage and said, hey, you're planting drugs. Like, we see you planting drugs on the body-worn camera. And the cop response was literally, well, no, you see what happened was I arrested the suspect and I found the drugs in the suspect. But then I realized my body-worn camera wasn't turned on. So I turned it back on and I went out and I put all the drugs back where I found it. And obviously th th this was not accepted. Nobody believed this, like this is ridiculous, no. Um, sh you know what he's doing today? The guy's still a cop on the force. He wasn't fired. Um, whereas if I were working at Walmart and surveillance footage found me stealing food off the shelf, you think I'd still be working at Walmart? Nope, I'd be fired and anybody else anywhere else would be fired. So uh, accountability is super problematic in situations uh, like that in relation to body camps. Hi, I'm Christopher Schneider, and I'm a full professor of sociology at Brandon University, and my research uh, addresses and studies the way in which media influence and change uh, sort of everyday life, uh, how people interact and come to understand the world. I am the author of a couple of different books and co-editor of books, so including Qualitative Media Analysis, published in 2013 with David Altidey. And uh, my recent book is Defining Sexual Misconduct, Power, Media, and Me Too. Thank you. When people think about social problems like the Me Too movement or, um, you know, Black Lives Matter or, you know, police overreach or something like that, they think like, as a sociologist, that's the thing that you do. You should go out and count the number of people affected and, you know, uh, offer a solution to policymakers. Why is the media even an important thing to study? I, I think the media are indeed the, the most important thing to study in the in the social world in which we currently live, because the, the ways in which people come to understand the world in which they live in and meaning that they derive about that world increasingly comes through mediated spaces. Now, to be sort of very clear, I'm not suggesting that media determine the way that people think. They do not. Uh, that's been referred to as the media effects approach and has been sort of widely dismissed in a lot of different academic circles. But rather, the media are a powerful and dominant social institution that wield great influence in how people come to, again, make understandings and meanings about the social world. And as we've seen, uh, media have had a powerful influence on, say, uh, the election outcomes, on global pandemics, uh, including vaccine uptake, uh, and whether or not people believe vaccines are effective, you know, regardless of what the scientific research literature and scientists have to say, how these materials then and the meanings that circulate around the materials, um, you know, flow through media. And I use that sort of largely in reference to both what's referred to as traditional media, which would be television, newspaper, radio, and, and social media and digital media is, I think, of, of paramount importance. And uh, I think it's incumbent on scholars to uh, investigate these materials to help better understand uh, the social world in which we live. So I was, um, I've been following the last month, well, it's over now, but I've been following Davos. And one of the big things that the people there were saying uh, was the biggest threat facing us now is fake news. That we we got to get a control on this. We got to, and it was sort of the subtext was like we got to control the narratives. <laughs> um, do you agree? Do you think that fake news is the is a big threat facing us? I mean, I, I think the short answer probably yes. I think the part part of the the problem with I mean fake news again first and foremost we need to define what exactly that means, right? So you know uh, what is a legitimate narrative and what is an illegitimate narrative. I think one of the issues here that ties into this idea of, of fake news is good news, uh, good journalism, investigative journalism, and good information is largely behind paywalls. You know, when you look at uh, major media organizations, um, the New York Times, Washington Post, other uh, credible, as it were, news media organizations, scientific journals and scientific research locked up behind paywalls, 
much of the information that people have sort of regular access to and unrestricted access to is the, the stuff that's freely available. And, when, and with that, I mean, there's a price for everything, right? So the, the information that's freely available, you know, what, what's the catch? Um, if you're not paying for it and the catch is it, it might not necessarily be um, accurate, true or correct. And I think in some ways this contributes to the rise of uh, this, you know, the, the widespread sharing of, of conspiracy theories, QAnon, uh, you know, Pizzagate and all this other kind of stuff uh, because of this, you know, freely accessible information, how people connect and revolve uh, around this information. Uh, in relation to fake news that comes from, say, politicians, notably Donald Trump in the United States, I mean, one of the, the problems here, and I think that there needs to be more discussion about this more broadly, is that media, and if, if we want to say good media, as, as I just did in relation to media that we have to pay for, is it's a commodity. I mean, it, it matters more that you subscribe to media that you're seeing the advertisements that, you know, are being packaged through media, right? Advertising, sponsorships, these sorts of things. And this is also another issue that gives rise to, uh, you know, fake news concerns. Um, we, we've seen the, the data and the evidence that Donald Trump gets a lot more press coverage than other political rivals because Donald Trump says and does ridiculous things. People tune in. It doesn't matter if what he's saying or doing is, is true or correct. Indeed, a lot of the times it's completely false and the evidence has been shown that it's false, but it gets uh, high ratings, high viewership. And indeed, the former head of CBS said that uh, something to the extent that you know, Donald Trump might not be good for America, but he's really good for CBS News or something like that in terms of boosting revenues. And that's another, I think, serious concern. When we talk about the circulation of these news media platforms. And if we want to sort of connect this to social media, then we could we could start talking about algorithms. Algorithms are something that we know very little about. And I use the royal we, both as publics and as scholars because algorithms are closely guarded secrets of social media companies. There's a really neat book by Frank Pasquale called The Black Box Society, and sort of he outlines some of that in that book. And what we do know about algorithms is that they're, they're programmed by their owners, uh, social media companies, and they are programmed to do a variety of things, including to boost and, and value certain messages and to sort of devalue other messages in terms of what people are exposed to. And we know that the social media algorithms typically tend to promote materials that are divisive because divisiveness keeps people engaged. And that's the point with social media is to keep people on these platforms so that people's information, what they're doing on these platforms can be sold to marketers. If the material that you're exposed to on social media, you sort of largely agree with it and you you know can quickly become disengaged and then you leave that platform, maybe go to another one or just log off entirely. And this is you know problematic for these companies who want to keep you engaged or for lack of a better word, word hooked on these platforms. And I, and I think that's another big issue here when trying to understand the promotion and circulation of fake news is trying to better understand social media algorithms. And again, something that we know very little about, and that's you know problematic for, for publics and scholars who wish to better understand how these meanings circulate in, in our everyday life. When I teach about social problems, that's sort of my main area of research is, is how social problems are mediated, you know, to, that um, it's not like a problem just speaks for itself and finds its way onto a newspaper page. It's, it's, you know, people have to make sense of the world. They have to frame it in a particular way. And so I can teach students to kind of shore themselves up against media narratives or be more active and critically engaged by sort of teaching them to recognize certain framing strategies, that sort of thing. But I've found that social media is its own beast. You know, so I teach a course where I kind of bring folklore in and I try to get students to recognize, you know, urban legends and aspects of urban legends. And I'm like, look, when you see this online, you know, there was this COVID during COVID. It was great because every day there was a new one. And it was like we were, you know, all over. It was like we were waiting in line in, you know, I don't know, Ohio at, at a 
um, COVID testing place. And we, we, it, the line was too long, so we left. And then after we got a text message that said our test was positive, but we never took the test, you know? perfect urban legends wonderful right the twist at the end and it was always and you could see the exact same tweet over and over and over again but the the details were changed we were in ohio we were in new york we were over here and so i can tell students to kind of recognize you know the the satisfying twist at the end but there's only it's, it's such a new beast is there anything that we can kind of tell people today what how can you shore yourself up against this kind of cacophony of strange claims that seem to be bombarding us all the time from from social media uh, not you know now it's it's not just the news media it's also you know twitter it's, you know, x it's facebook what can we do to be more critical critically engaged i think first and foremost as qualitative researchers people who research social problems is is a focus on meaning and process so as you just noted right there's you know a single tweet in, in ohio and mm -hmm. you know okay well are there other similar tweets and as you said yes there are and, and can we start to trace where these so the, the origin of you know the, the original tweet or message or post on social media and then start to see how and where it travels how it travels how meanings are attached to those tweets or those social media messages as they travel and through a a, a critical and rigorous scholarly investigation of meaning and process this helps us to better understand where these claims come from uh, how they move and how they're adopted by other claims makers, all of which helps us to better understand the meaning making process more broadly. And I think this is something that it, it becomes, I think also increasingly difficult on social media and digital media more broadly, because I mean, in some ways we're searching for a, a needle in a haystack. I mean, there, there are billions and billions of documents, posts on social media. And how do we even begin to, trace the origins uh, of a particular message. Um, so one of the things I, I've given workshops on qualitative media analysis and, and, you know, students and junior scholars will regularly ask me like, well, you know, how do I, how do I do this? I mean, you know, studying the internet as it were is, a, is akin to drinking water from a fire hose. Um, you, <laughs> you can't, can't really do it. So, you know the, the short answer is i give to, to students and, and junior scholars is to to make a case and make a case for how you're going to approach these materials and, and one good case uh that we can sort of do or provide as a instance would be to follow hashtags hashtags are i think are really interesting because a hashtag is not owned by anyone hashtags aren't owned by social media platforms, right? Facebook doesn't own hashtags, uh, Twitter doesn't, although that's where the origin of the hashtag comes from. Uh, it's Twitter, it was developed by uh, Chris Messina, I think is his name, a tech developer in Twitter in 2007. And, you know, we think about how hashtags changed, how people communicate and people organize around hashtags. And I think we have an easier time tracing how hashtags move across social media platforms and how meaning uh, becomes attached to hashtags and drops off other hashtags. You know, as, as you noted earlier in a conversation, you know, you look at the Black Lives Matter movement and the subsequent hashtag, you look at the rise of the hashtag Me Too, the Time's Up. I mean, there are a variety of hashtags and seeing how people make sense of meanings around those hashtags. So, you know, for example, in uh, my book, Defining Sexual Misconduct, co-authored with Stacey Hannum at Wilfrid Laurie University, there's a chapter in there where we we, we investigate the, the Me Too hashtag and the meanings that surround that in relation to uh, bringing to light uh, not only perpetrators of sexual harms, but discussions and meanings around the very what very constitutes the the idea of, of sexual harms. So, I mean, one of some of the things we we found that were we thought were quite interesting, and, and we sort of we fleshed this out a bit more in the, the book more broadly is, you know, uh, several of the tweets and uh, i mean hundreds of the tweets that we collected thousands indeed talked about you know um you know sexual assault and, and some of the really sort of uh, uh terrible uh forms of sexual harms criminal sexual harms and we expected to find some of those materials i, I think what we were surprised about uh, surprised to find were people using the hashtag the me too hashtag and talking about say things like getting cat called or you know somebody asking for your phone number hashtag me too and one of the things in our analysis that we noticed was other people 
uh, mostly women were, you know, piling on to these hashtags through the comments and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, like, because someone asked for your phone number doesn't mean, you know, this is me too. You know, uh, I was sexually assaulted. That's what the Me Too movement is about. And you start to see if disagreements uh, among people about what constitutes sexual harms, right? And, you know, I, we can't deny or dismiss someone's experience having felt you know, that, you know, I, they were catcalled and that was a type of, of sexual harm. It's very real for people. And, you know, as, as people who are studying social problems, importantly, we, we weren't doing that in our book. We weren't dismissive of these types of claims that people were advancing, but rather trying to understand how these meanings become attached to you know, the hashtag itself and how the hashtag moves across social media platforms and brings to our attention sexual harms, including uh, the very idea of sexual harms. And one of the things that we discuss in the book is, you know, the historically sexual harms have largely been understood in the context of the criminal law. And if uh, somebody is harmed you know, with sexual assault and, and, the, and a crime happens, that's bad, obviously. Uh, anything outside of that, that is not recognized by the law as a crime, therefore, the reasoning is that it must not be harmful. And that's just simply not mm -hmm. true. And so these are the things, you know, this sort of meaning making process is, is some of the stuff that emerged from our analysis of the use of the hashtag uh, Me Too. That contestation is really interesting because I always remember this paper from years and years ago, Nichols something about the dialogical nature of claims making. And, um, and it used to be just that we would say, news media are dialogical, uh, that you would make a claim and then you would be subject to counterclaims and you kind of change your rhetoric as a result. But that process was slow. <laughs> you know, if anyone paid attention, if anyone paid attention at all, you might get a counterclaim. If you were successful, you know, enough to for someone to notice. But now it, it seems that that dialogical nature of, of claims making is so apparent you know, you make these, you, you make an expansive claim about, you know, this was, it's a very common thing, right? To expand the nature of a, of a claim to say, look, this, this thing that you think of typically only as very, very harmful in extreme cases, actually it represents a spectrum of experience. It's a very common thing that people do um, for better or for worse. It's a controversial thing. People say, well, it, it tends to um, expand or um, inflate our understanding of harms in the world. And we, we get a, a very kind of inflated idea of just how bad things are, because when someone gives you a statistic, they don't tell you that what's behind the statistic might be that inflated definition. At the same time, you don't want to leave anybody out, right? So, but that example just really shows just how that controversy can be so much in your face. And I wonder if, a part of me wonders if some of the fears around fake news and discussions on social media and polarization is that incredibly quick and in your face dialogical nature of claims making. So a claims maker, like a policymaker, can't just tweet something without having a ton of abuse, <laughs> but also pushback immediately. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that, that kind of what effect that dialogical nature has on our, our understanding of social problems. Well, I mean, there are a few things that are going on there. I mean, first and foremost, when you look at claims making around uh, a policy around science, these things happen slowly, of course. Mm -hmm. So studying uh, the, whether vaccines are effective or cancer treatments are effective or whatever it may or may not be, it takes time. And, and you know, there's a methodological rigor there. There's a scientific rigor. And when we factor in online and social media, everything is immediate. And I think this has really changed the the public's expectations about you know the immediacy of information, uh, when especially when members of the public might not really understand how science works. And science is slow, and it's a conversation. And so, for for on the one hand, for scientists and policymakers to put out a, a social media post, a tweet, or whatever. You know, hey, we're working on the vaccines. We don't fully understand yet, but uh, all the other evidence points to you know, people pile on. You know, what do you mean all the other evidence? Where's the evidence for this? Why are we talking about? It? And there's a lot of questions around that. On the other hand, when we look at, you know, the the sort of the diametrically opposed statements that that people might make, uh, social media is what it's done has exacerbated media performativity. So with with individuals performing. Uh, on these spaces. The, the, the point of 
media performativity on social media is to get likes, it's to get attention, it's to go viral. This is, you know, this is why people post, you know, images of, you know, selfies and, and, and indeed, you know, this has given rise to, to new social problems and new social phenomenon, including selfie deaths. I mean, it's been called the public health crisis that, you know, people are, are doing more drastic and extreme measures to, you know, take the selfie in the lion's den or whatever it might be. And then they're mauled by lions um, because that's what gets attention. And the cultural space is crowded. And this is something I think that people are engaging in more extreme statements, whether or not they believe them or not is less relevant. Um, that, that, that sort of contributes to this idea of fake news and more about, can I go viral by saying this thing? So you, you <laughs> mentioned COVID, for example, and I, I was reminded of one of the more um, ridiculous, in, in my opinion, tweets was the one that was made by Nicki Minaj, the, the rap artist who said something to the extent that her cousin's testicles became swollen and it became impotent because they got the COVID vaccine, which is completely uh, not true and not supported by any scientific evidence. And that tweet went viral. I think it was tweeted over a hundred thousand times and, and people they pay attention to that. It became the subject of late night news media commentary, uh, jokes, other sorts of things. I mean, you look at, again, with social problems, how how jokes and memes contribute to this process as well uh, of the claims making process. And, you know, did Nick did that actually happen? I don't know. Does Nicki Minaj actually believe that? I don't know. But she said it and it got a lot of attention. And, you know, she's got millions of followers online. And this is another problem, as I spoke to before, in relation to algorithms, which tend to promote and boost messages, not only that are divisive, but those that are made by celebrity figures. In a lot of ways, the, the hierarchy in news media or traditional media in relation to celebrity and you know, providing spaces for celebrities to make claims has been mapped onto social media where, you know, again, we, when we studied this with Me Too, the Me Too movement was incorrectly attributed to Hollywood actor Alyssa Milano. Uh, now, she sparked the Me Too movement by putting up the post on Twitter that said, you know, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, uh, write Me Too in response to this tweet. She did not use the hashtag. That's important to clarify. And, you know, that, that sort of sparked the Me Too movement. We know that African-American activist Toronto Burke started Me Too in 2006. And Toronto Burke, prior to, you know, the Me Too movement was unknown. You know, she was an activist. She was not a celebrity and, you know, did not get the same type of attention that people like Alyssa Milano. And, and since Melissa Milano said that she had never heard of, Alana, uh, of Toronto Burke and indeed did give credit to Toronto Burke for starting the Me Too movement. So, I mean, this is another issue we start talking about you know, the, the evolution of claims making, the meaning and process, the role of algorithms in promoting content and, and celebrities saying and doing things. And, you know, you look at, you know, Donald Trump, for example, and, you know, his sort of gonzo approach to politics. And, you know, Donald Trump is himself a meme. Uh, David Altidy has made this claim in his most recent book. Um, and this is part of the, the, the sort of the mediated social world in, in which we live, all of which contributes to a real muddying, uh, if you will, of truth claims, uh, claims making more generally, this idea of legitimate and illegitimate news or, or fake news, uh, all of which I think has become um, very difficult to, not only for just members of the public to understand or differentiate between, you know, what they think is good and, you know, legitimate information, but also, you know, for scholars who are attempting to do similar things. And as social problems scholars, scholars who engage in social constructivist research, you really got to pull back on that. It's not about what's true and what's not true, but rather it's about the meaning making process in relation to claims and how claims are made and advanced. And you know, that could become difficult to do when some of this information that we're analyzing as scholars is, you know, uh, outrageous, ridiculous, inflammatory, uh, racist, sexist, uh, homophobic, all these sorts of things. And, you know, it, it, it's hard. I think it's a challenge. And that's something I think we need to talk more about um, on as a social problems analysis, not necessarily taking a 
moral side or stance on the claim that you're trying to investigate. This is something I've seen, we've seen a shift in over the past several years, indeed several decades, where, I mean, previously, when you look at claims making in, you know, the, those scholarly research that's looked at, you know, news reports in the 80s and the 90s and, you know, the satanic panic from the 1980s, one of my favorites uh, uh, research that's that's done that. Um, those claims were ridiculous-ish, right? But they, they appeal mm -hmm. to groups of people. But because of, of, you know, anybody could log on to social media and like people like Donald Trump, they can make claims that are not only just ridiculous, but are, are just outrageous uh, and offensive and morally uh, reprehensible and you know, all these sorts of things. And yeah. trying to sort of step back from that becomes, I, I think, a challenge. It becomes, I think, particularly challenging because I think this approach encourages you to be a kind of um, a slow thinker, you know, um, that when everyone is sort of panicking about something, um, I'm always sort of like, oh, that's interesting, you know, <laughs> and I'm really sort of like collecting the claims and well, that, you know, oh, why, why that particular thing? Why that motif? Why do I see that again and again and again? And I get a lot of flack for that because people are saying, why don't you care about this problem? Oh, you're always downplaying this problem. Don't you realize it's a really big issue? It's the biggest issue facing us. And I'm sort of saying, well, I know that the biggest issue facing us is often the one that has been packaged in a particular way. And, you know, you need to know something in order to think like this. You need to know something about the medium. Because when I see a message, I'm thinking about the medium immediately. Like, why did this get into the headline? Why did the editor either commission or accept this particular piece why you know but people don't do that there's a sense that there's like this thing we're all talking about it because there's some truth to it not necessarily the case which is why the satanic panic is such a great example because you know there's at least some groups in society latched onto this for very particular reasons and not because there were cabals of satanists sacrificing babies you know what i mean so the question that we ask ourselves is well why has this become so powerful? Um, and so you mentioned about jokes and memes, which I found very interesting because this was always part of the broader kind of repertoire of what, you know, uh, someone who studies communications would study, right? Jokes, joke cycles, photocopier lore, you know, this sort of thing. But now it's it's come together in a, in a much more um, clear way with social problems. So what's this relationship, or is there a relationship between sort of jokes, memes, and the way that we talk about the problems that face us? Well, I think one of the things is memes are easier to share and they go viral more quickly. Memes also, there's much less initial engagement in the meme. So for example, you know, if you had to, we think about, again, the satanic panic, we keep coming to that because, you know, that, that's a, a shared favorite one here. You know, there, there was a story there, you know, and the story, as you note, with the the Ohio COVID thing, it, it sort of morphs and it starts with, you know, these kids sacrificing and then, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and they're listening to, you know, what, whatever it is. And then, the, and it, it, there's a narrative, essentially. And following a narrative takes takes time. There's uh, a heightened level of engagement when we're following narratives. You know, and pe people like this, of course. I mean, they watch reality TV. We, we watch Netflix. You know, people read books. I mean, you know, people engage with narratives. But it, it's time consuming. And when you're looking at materials in relation to social problems and the contemporary, you know, social media and virality and getting stuff out there quickly there's a lot less time. It doesn't correspond with the logic of social media in terms of its immediacy. Memes are immediate and they take a lot less engagement in terms of following a particular story or narrative. And you can quickly share it and then people quickly share it and these go viral and they give they can give rise, I think, to new and different types of, of narratives uh, that might be surrounding a particular set of claims making or claims makers. And I think it's one of the reasons why we've seen sort of memes take off and, and jokes as well. But again, the joke is a, is, a, is, is a slower type of narrative. You know, you have to sort of tell the joke as it were. And, and same with research, as you know, like the, the slow thinker. When we're doing research and writing about these materials, we're also developing a narrative. And, you know, again, the logic of social media and the different platforms in how 
the content. You know, when we look at the difference between form and content, this becomes paramount as well. And, and you already noted that. So to have something go viral on, say, TikTok is it involves particular understanding of the way in which that social media platform works. You know, it's short video snippets, you know, a couple of seconds or whatever it may be that you're trying to put out there versus a post on Twitter or a photograph on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, so on and so forth. Now, to be clear, these different social media platforms can often accept different types of content. So Instagram, you could put a photograph and you can write a narrative underneath the photograph and use hashtags, people do. But the, the dominant way in which people communicate on that particular platform is through, is through photos. Uh, TikTok is videos. Again, you could add text to videos, um, but the, the, the dominant way in which you know, people engage in that platform is, is through the use of video. So uh, taking all this into consideration as well, I think, is, is important. Can you think of an example of a movement or a problem that was propelled by a particularly well-placed meme or joke or, or even an individual? Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe the let's go, Brandon, you know, the, uh, around, you know, the dismissal of everything that is Joe Biden and Democrats, you know, and the way in which, you know, because that, that's just the text. You write, let's go, Brandon, and you put it over, say, a picture of Joe Biden or maybe even just type, let's go, Brandon. And that ties into a, a whole narrative about, you know, the evil Democrats and, you know, this and that and the other. And you don't even really have to have a full uh, awareness or understanding of exactly what Let's Go Brandon is being used in reference to other than it's anti Joe Biden and it's anti Democrats uh, and it's, you know, pro Republican, pro MAGA, pro Trump. Um, there's, there's a whole lot going on there. But to just share something, let's let's go, Brandon. I, I think that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind, putting me on the spot. Mm -hmm.